I'm supposed to talk about origins in the modern world and why it matters. And my talk's going to be real easy because you're all here, so you must have thought it mattered, so we can close the session and all go jump in the pool. Is that the, a good idea? Yeah. Okay. Well, by modern world, I'm really talking about the world after World War II, particularly the last half of the last century, the 1950s and the 60s onwards. And more or less since that time, it's become the age of who cares? You know, apathy rules, nothing much matters. Someone said we live in an era of mind over matter. I don't mind, you don't matter, unless you can do something to make me feel good or in some way or another to help me. But somehow one thing that everyone seems to care about is the future of our kids. And we live in an age of soaring rates of children's mental illness. That's a strange way to start a creation talk, isn't it? Talking about children's mental illness. Physical child abuse, attention and behavioral disorders are soaring. Youth suicide, crime, substance abuse, and so on. Now, as a former medical doctor, I'm the last person to try to downplay the complexity of these issues and all of the other factors that can come into that. Now, I'm not talking about individual cases, I'm talking about the big picture. Why are these things so much worse? In, those last, in that last half a century. You might be saying, yeah, I know where he's going. He's gonna blame evolution. And the answer is, well, not exactly. I'm going to say that it's got a lot to do with us, with believers, with the church. See, we had the answers, and yet by and large, as far as our culture is concerned, we've sacrificed our evangelical heritage because on the whole, we were too afraid to take a stand on the truth of God's word, particularly in this foundational area of origins, science, the history, history of what? Of life, the universe, and everything. You know, in a recent study, co-sponsored by Dartmouth Medical School, it's just been released uh, the last few weeks, with 33 professional authors, and they concluded that children's brains are designed to connect. They're designed to need connection to what they call authoritative communities, families, community groups, and particularly to churches, which give young people what this study called a direct personal relationship with the divine. And this is what it concluded. It concluded that children are hardwired to want answers to purpose and meaning. It also concluded that church going protects significantly against mental illness. And very recently in the Sydney Sun Herald, an article said this among other things on that second half of that slide, as church going slumped, so did children's emotional well-being. A staggering 20% of our Australian children have mental health problems. Has it always been this way? No, this has developed since World War II. Notice that, church going slumping since World War II. See, Evolutionary teaching really took, took off in the 1960s, the early 1960s. Have a look at this graph. Here we have incidents of childhood church involvement. Notice how the curve really starts to sag beginning in those early 1960s. And notice how at the same time, there's been a dramatic parallel rise in suicides of all things. That's male youth suicide. Incredible parallel. You know, again, I don't want to downplay the complexity of these things and the influence of depression and so on, but I'm saying that there are aggravating factors in the culture as a whole that must be operating when you see figures like this and some of the other figures you're going to be, to be seeing. And it makes a lot of sense. Here's one of Dan Lether. Um, he's the uh, AIG USA staff cartoonist. Here's one of his tremendous cartoons. And, Here's this girl saying to her student colleague, you look depressed, what happened in your last class? And she answers, today I learned that we're nothing special, just animals, little more than highly evolved apes, the result of a giant cosmic accident. Well, uh, what are you learning in your next class? Self-esteem. <laughs> See, at the end of the day, if you believe, and you're taught as all of reality is that you're nothing much more than reorganized pond scum. If you're taught that the best you've got to hope for after you die is maybe if you're very fortunate to be recycled as organic manure, 
If you believe that you're nothing more than a great number in the, uh, sorry, than a number in the great casino of the universe, then your brain has no more intrinsic value than the equally randomly evolved back leg of a blowfly. So why shouldn't you blow it out when the going gets tough? If life's a pain and then you die and there's nothing more to it, what's it all about? What's the point? You know, as a GP, I used to see young people who were experimenting with the latest drug and so on, and they knew, they told me they had seen their friends fry their brains. That was their expression. You know, become permanently, you know, mentally burned out with whatever drug it was. And yet it didn't matter. You know, what difference does it make? I'm just a, a mess of evolved chemicals. I remember when looking at these sorts of problems some years ago in Australia, when talking like this, some people used to come up and say, well, I think it's the economy. I think it's unemployment. And they used to blame all these other sort of factors. But you know something I used to say to them, you remember the Great Depression? Unemployment has never been worse. And yet people were not, young people were not blowing their brains out the way they're doing it today. Actually in Australia right now, we are in a roaring economic boom. We've had over a decade of unprecedented continual economic expansion. So what is the reality in Australia today? In 2003, here we are, in Australia, suicide has surpassed motor vehicle accidents as the number one killer of males aged 25 to 44. And again in the Sun Herald, suicide by Australian males aged 15 to 19, a different age bracket, has quadrupled in the past 30 years. So why did, you know, going back to that link between church going and suicide, why did church going decline so dramatically from 1960 onwards? Well, you think about it. You've got young people hungry for answers. We've seen that they're hardwired to want answers to meaning and purpose. What's life all about? What am I all about? Where's it all going? And so on. And where were those answers coming from? Traditionally, they were coming from the church. And yet all of a sudden, we had this incredible push like never before to give substitute answers to those same questions. Here we have a quotation from Richard Lewontin. He's a Harvard University zoology professor. He says this, he says, evolution was barely mentioned in school textbooks as late as 1954. After Sputnik, which was 1957, the study of evolution was suddenly in all the schools. Can you see why should we be, you know, if you're a young person at that time or a parent deciding whether to send your child to church or religious instruction, you remember how many parents like mine, even though they were not Christians, they would still send you somewhere to get a little bit of religion because they thought it was a good thing? Well, after you have all this pushing, pushing, pushing in the media with each generation, the schools and so on, that evolution is fact, what's it really saying? It really says, well, the Bible's not true. The Bible's not factual. The Bible doesn't you know, speak the truth about history. Why should we do that then? Why should we send people to church if it doesn't mean much, if it's only just something that's real inside your head and if it doesn't really connect to the reality of the world around us? You know, I want to show you a quote by Sir Julian Huxley. He's the grandson of Thomas Huxley, who was called Darwin's bulldog. He was a, an evangelist for Darwin, if you like, back in Darwin's day. And uh, Julian Huxley said this in the 1950s. He said, uh, in the evolutionary pattern of thought, there is no longer need or room for the supernatural. The earth was not created, it evolved. So did all the animals and plants that inhabit it, including our human selves, mind and soul, as well as brain and body. So did religion. You know, then there's Will Provine. He's a prominent biology professor at Cornell University. And this is what he said. He said, belief in modern evolution makes atheists of people. And he's an atheist. He said, one can have a religious view that is compatible with evolution only if the religious view is indistinguishable from atheism. In other words, if for all practical purposes, the God that you believe in does nothing more than light the fuse of the Big Bang or some imaginary idea like that, and then sits back and it all happens by itself. Well, where's the practical difference between that and being an atheist? And then he goes on to say this. He says, let me summarize my views on what modern biology tells us loud and clear. There are no gods, no purposes, no goal-directed forces of any kind. By the way, all of this is logical. It's taking evolution to its logical conclusion. There is no life after death. When I die, I'm absolutely certain that I'm going to be dead. That's the end for me. 
There is no ultimate foundation for ethics, no ultimate meaning to life, and no free will for humans either. You know, there was a uh, person called Houston Smith writing in uh, The Christian Century in 1982, and he said, Martin Lings is probably right in saying that, and here he's quoting, he says, more cases of loss of religious faith are to be traced to the theory of evolution than to anything else. Why is that? You know, Frank Zindler, the prominent atheist, sums it up really well in this quote. He says, the most devastating thing that biology did to Christianity was the discovery of evolution. Now that we know, this is him talking, that Adam and Eve never were real people, the central myth of Christianity is destroyed. If there never was an Adam and Eve, there never was an original sin. If there never was an original sin, there is no need of salvation. If there's no need of salvation, there's no need of a saviour. And I submit that puts Jesus, historical or otherwise, into the ranks of the unemployed. I think that evolution is absolutely the death knell of Christianity. I wish you'd tell that to uh, some of those theological colleges and Bible colleges and seminaries that are flirting with theistic evolution and similar ideas more and more all around this country. You know, I don't think I have to tell too many of you here that there's also been, since those 50s and 60s, an upsurge in property crime. You know, I, I often talk about my parents who were not Christians. I didn't grow up in a Christian home, but they lived by the Christian ethic. Some things were always right, some things were always wrong, regardless of your opinion. And in those days, most people in our culture lived like that. You know, it was very common to go shopping and leave the keys in the ignition of your car and not worry too much. In fact, the first Holden cars in this country were made that you didn't even need an ignition key to start them. No one would make a car like that today. I go anywhere in the once Christian Western world and I get the same responses. I ask the people with a little bit of gray hair like me when they, uh, you know, do they remember a time when they could leave their keys in the car and not worry too much? And you see these nodding heads all over the auditorium and then you say, would you do that today? And heads shaking all over the place. It's the same sort of story because you see that post Sputnik upsurge in evolutionary teaching happened right around the Western world, you know, basically radiating from the United States, which was worried that the Russians were beating them in the space race and these sorts of things. By the way, evolution is not the cause of the upsurge in lawlessness. Sin is, but sin's always been there. The question is, why are these things worse? You see, what people believe can act as a restraint upon sin. Evolution has become a justification for the rejection of God's absolutes. See, if nobody made me, then nobody owns me, as we often like to say, and then there's nobody to set the rules. I set my own rules. You know, here's another one of those wonderful perceptive cartoons of Dan Lethers. He's, this guy's saying, don't tell me about God's absolutes and rules for life. I'm against all absolutes. And they ask, so you insist on making your own rules for life? Absolutely. So that's, that's his one absolute. You know, people say they don't believe in absolutes, but they absolutely insist that they can make up their own rules for life. You know, the same sorts of trend as we saw for suicide and as I've told you about in property crime and so on, occurred for violent crime as well. In this graph, we see, um, again, with that line at about 1960, we see this tremendous upsurge in crimes of violence in Australia. This is from the Australian Bureau of Statistics. You know, all of you, I'm sure, even though you don't live in the United States, would, uh, most of you, would have heard of the Littleton School Massacre, you know, where a couple of high school students went on a shooting spree and uh, gunned down many of their colleagues, many of their fellow students. Here is the father of one of them. Her name was Rachel Scott, who was shot in that massacre in 1999. And this is what this man, this father, said. He said, if children are taught that they came from slime, that they evolved from a lower form of life and that there's no future after death, then their views of life are affected by that. Life really doesn't have the meaning that it does to children who believe they are created in God's image and that they have not only this life, but a future life as well. Is there any evidence that evolutionary thinking featured in the thinking of the killers? There is. You know, one of them was actually wearing a T-shirt which with natural selection all over it. And in fact, here's a quote from one of them, from a video that they taped beforehand. Sometime in April, 
Me and Dylan will get revenge and will kick natural selection up a few notches. Well, it's now nearly half a century after Sputnik. What is the message that's still being pumped out through the media to our young people? Is it that, you know, life now has this great, wonderful purpose? No. Here's a recent quote from Professor John Carmody, uh, Faculty of Medicine at the University of New South Wales here in Sydney. He says, what is the meaning of life? Simply to ensure the continuity of the DNA. Boy, that's pretty depressing if I really believed that as a young person. And that was in the daily paper here in Sydney. And that incidentally is logical if the Bible is not telling the truth about origins. You know, all of Jesus' teachings on marriage, we often say, went back to Genesis. Jesus didn't say, I think, and this is my opinion, what do you think? He said, haven't you read? He was talking about Genesis. Even when I was an atheist at university, it was obvious to me that Jesus believed in a literal Adam, literal Eve. He said, he that made them male and female, and so on. You know? And of course, he built his whole doctrine of marriage on those literal historical events in Genesis. You know, the reason why we are to leave our parents as if we had none, Adam and Eve had no parents, literally and historically. The reason why we're supposed to cleave to each other emotionally and metaphorically so close as if we were one flesh is because Adam and Eve literally were one flesh, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, and so on. So it's no surprise that in that same period that I've been talking about, we've seen a tremendous breakdown in marriage, marriage destruction. You know, the pain of marriage destruction in this increasingly non-God-centered generation has with a certainty affected even many of us here in this room in one way or another. And of course, this sort of thing will further erode the quality of life for countless young people, adding to that spiral of drugs, depression, suicide and crime. You know, today, especially in the US, which is really the engine room of Christianity, Everybody looks to it for, you know, trends, for leadership, that sort of thing. It's popular for evangelical leaders to be anti-Darwin. You might think, well, isn't that great? You know what? It's not. Because tragically, most of them miss the point. Because at the same time, most of them are not only allowing for, but they're actually pushing for acceptance of the millions of years as fact. You see, friends, the issue never has been whether or not God could have created by evolution or could have created in batches over millions of years. But the issue is that he gave us a straightforward history in the book of Genesis. This came before that, which came before that. And that history blows apart, not just evolution in the sense of frogs turning into princes, but it blows apart the whole story of cosmic evolution and geological evolution and all of the stuff from which the millions of years comes. In short, Genesis and millions of years are totally incompatible. I remember when I was an atheist at university, people, Christians that I was arguing with and so on, they were trying to say that millions of years was a side issue and could be compatible with the Bible. And that was so obviously illogical. They would come at me with, you know, gap theory, have this obviously imaginary gap between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2, and they'd dream up a thing called Lucifer's flood that the Bible doesn't mention and try to squeeze the millions of years there between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2. And then they'd uh, have this other theory where they'd stretch the days into billions of years and so on. But you know, I had to actually tell them that they were obvious compromises. This is an atheist outside of Christianity and that these were hopeless compromises. You know, the millions of years idea comes from the fossil record. It comes from the idea that those billions of dead things laid down by water all over the world were laid down millions of years ago. But if we look at those billions of dead things at that fossil record, we see that they're full of things like, you know, suffering, death, cancer, thorns. You remember how thorns were only supposed to come in after sin and so on? So if these things were laid down millions of years ago, the Bible's wrong. If there's cancer in the world for millions of years, whether you believe in evolution or don't believe in evolution, there's no point praying for healing. Cancer must be something that God thinks is all very good. And you know what? It destroys any explanation for suffering and cancer and so on, God must like it that way. But if the fossils are the result of Noah's flood, then all of this was formed after Adam's fall and we have an explanation for death and suffering in a world which was originally declared all very good. In other words, in a sense, it becomes our fault. You know, some people think, and it's understandable, that design is the key. If only we can just 
just highlight all the incredible design in the world, everybody will fall down and say, wow, there must be a designer, end of evolution. And then we don't need to worry about the millions of years. Well, you know, design is a powerful argument, but think of this. I'm sure many of you would have, would have seen David Attenborough on television and seen these incredibly beautiful programs and you would have seen all the design. And I guarantee that many of you would have been frustrated thinking, why can't he see it? Anybody like that? And think, well, I'd like to point it out to him. I'd like to write to him and say, you know, hey, why don't you give God the credit? Why don't you give him the glory? And isn't it obvious? And so on. You know what? Many Christians, not surprisingly, have written to Attenborough. And they've asked him that. You know, why don't you give credit to Almighty God? And this is what he says. He says, when creationists talk about God creating, they always instance hummingbirds or orchids, sunflowers and beautiful things. You know, all things bright and beautiful, that sort of non-biblical fairy tale image of the world and then he goes on and he says but I tend to think instead of a parasitic worm that is boring through the eye of a boy sitting on the bank of a river in West Africa a worm that's going to make him blind and I ask them are you telling me that the God you believe in the God who you also say is an all merciful God who cares for each one of us individually are you saying that God created this worm that can live in, in no other way than in an innocent child's eyeball because that doesn't seem to me to coincide with a God who's full of mercy. You know, friends, these are valid questions. And if we don't answer those questions, if we don't have an answer, then we're not doing what the Bible commands to give people an answer, a reason for the hope. But how can we give an answer with integrity to Attenborough's challenge unless we take seriously that history in Genesis? including the fall of the whole creation which affected all of the creation. And anyway, if we don't take seriously what is obviously meant to be intended as literal history in the Bible, how can we expect rational people to take seriously the Bible's message of morality and salvation? And that's really what I meant earlier when I said that Christendom itself bears a lot of the responsibility for the decline in Western culture. Because when young people turn to the church for answers, often deep down wanting the Bible to be true, what were they told? You know, I was sent by my mother to confirmation classes, Lutheran confirmation classes. I grew up in the Barossa Valley. My parents weren't church goers at all, but they thought I could do with a bit of religion, you know, the sort of thing. And we learnt from the catechism book all about Adam and Eve and the original sin. And you know what? I started asking questions. I said, hang on a minute, Adam, what was it like? Was he an ape man? You know, did he club Eve over the head and drag her into the cave and, uh, and all the rest of it? And you know what I was told? Basically, don't question. You've just got to believe. No answers. What was the message that was pumped out to me and to the rest of the class? That Christianity has no answers. That there's a sort of a totally different world. There's the world of rocks and fossils and trees and plants and cavemen and all this sort of things. And over here, you've got the almost fantasy world of the Bible. And many people are still being told that sort of thing today. You know, just, just have faith and believe. And worse is the fact that even greater numbers are being told in many different fuzzy, woolly, sophisticated, honeyed words disguising the real meaning in a sense that Genesis really doesn't mean what it says. But you know, the non-Christian is generally not stupid and most people know compromise and surrender when they see it. Remember I talked about Thomas Huxley, Darwin's bulldog? He was particularly scathing when he wrote about all the ducking and the weaving and the twisting and the turning that the church, which was desperate to embrace this new teaching called evolution, that the church engaged in to try to explain away the contradictions. Here is what he said. He said, I soon lose my way when I try to follow those who walk delicately among types and allegories. A certain passion for clearness forces me to ask bluntly whether the writer meant to say that Jesus did not believe the stories in question or that he did. When Jesus spoke, as a matter of fact, that the flood came and destroyed them all, did he believe that the deluge really took place or not? You know, when I was at university, I was knocking around with the young humanists and so on, so I knew how unbelievers like myself thought, and I tell you, we had no time whatsoever. We would, we would secretly despise those who were trying to have two bob each way, those, those who were compromising their faith, because it was just so obvious what they were doing. To us, they were just not facing up to reality and, um, and yet we wouldn't say that 
to their face, obviously. You know, deep down I can tell you I had more respect for someone who made a stand and who knew what they believed, or at least I would have had, but they were pretty rare. In fact, I don't remember one throughout all of university. You know, if the Bible is not telling us believable things about history, what sense does it make to trust it with our eternal future? You know, Jesus put it well in John 3.12. He said, if I've told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? Is it any wonder that our Christianity has so little impact upon the culture compared to yesteryear? You know what we've often done? We've really, in effect, retreated into worship ghettos. You know, there might be big worship ghettos, some of them, most of them small worship ghettos in this country, but really we've been bluffed by a fear, I think, an unconscious fear that this battle is too big for us. The Bible really can't compete in this arena. That the safest way to avoid admitting that we don't have answers is to duck the questions, to pretend it doesn't matter. So we put a fence around things like morality and salvation and so on, and we say, that's what my faith is all about. All these other things, we won't get into them. They're not our thing. What's the message we're pumping out? We're saying Christianity isn't relevant to real things like science, history, biology, and so on. You know, a church can pump out that message even by never having any sort of open negativity about Genesis or creation apologetics or anything, simply by never dealing with it. You're telling the young kids it doesn't matter because we never talk about it. It's only, I believe, when we do totally believe and proclaim the whole truth of the Bible, the big picture, I'm not talking about, you know, the little nitpicky areas that we often get so fussed about, that the salt that we're supposed to be to the culture can flow freely to flavour the whole stew of the culture around us, to preserve it, to stop it decaying so quickly. By the way, who do you think said this? He said, things have come to a pretty pass when religion is allowed to invade public life. Was it some, you know, secular humanist of today or something like this? No, it was Lord Melbourne, former UK Prime Minister. What was the issue he was upset about? What were his opponents on about where he said, we don't, I don't want you to bring religion into politics. The issue was the abolition of slavery. His opponents who wanted to abolish slavery were passionate Bible-believing Christians and they were people who saw the big picture, namely that man had been made in the image of God and that man had been given dominion in Genesis only over plants and animals, not other people. You know, there are horrific things going on in our world today. Child slavery, even adult slavery, exploitation, corruption and suffering on unimaginable scales. Almost invariably, these go on in countries which have no strong biblical Christian heritage. I don't say that with the slightest sense of smugness. I'm pointing it out to say that we take for granted our freedom, our relative freedom from those things in Western society. What am I talking about? Things like personal liberty, social compassion. You know, I was horrified to hear of people coming from countries where, when I was a doctor and these patients newly emigrated from some of these countries, and I'd say I was sending them to the hospital, they were really afraid and so on. And I found out why, where they came from, you had to bribe the doctors and the nurses, you had to pay for your food if you needed a morphine injection, you had to pay the same value as people could get it out on the street and these sorts of things. And you know what, we often forget that these advantages that we enjoy are not the results of any intrinsic Western racial superiority. They are not the results of humanistic enlightenment they are the results, historically and demonstrably, of people set on fire by the Holy Spirit through preaching that regarded every word of the Bible as utterly true. The abolition of child labor, of slavery, of hosp the hospital reform issue, prison reform, orphanage reform, and so on, all of them happened in a very basically compressed period of time. The results of the gospel revolution that overtook Britain and America just before evolutionary science took over. We'll see later this week how racism, too, goes against what the Bible teaches about the true history of man. It's just one more reason why it matters what you believe about history. And not surprisingly, it matters to science and technology, too. You know, the benefits we have from Western science and technology, how often do we just take for granted that they happened in Western Europe? You know, isn't it true, if we're really honest, that there's a bit of racism in that? 
a bit of a belief, well, of course, you know, we're, we're smarter, you know, we must be, because look at all the stuff that came from there. You know what? The Arabs, the Chinese, they were much more advanced, but they didn't go further. Why? Because as even modern philosophers now recognize over and over, it was Christianity, the understanding of the Bible that followed the Reformation, which made all the difference, made the seed bed in which modern science could flourish. What sense does it make to look for rules that are unchanging until you believe in a God who is unchanging, who sets the rules, and who's not capricious? You know, the ancient Greeks, they had gods that were basically rascals. They could change their mind. So, you know, what goes down one day might go up the next. What was the point of modern science? If you saw a fish in a rock and people saw fossils and things, well, that was just, you know, Zeus up to his old tricks. You know, he's fooling us. But when the father of modern geology saw a fish in a rock, he could think clearly and logically and say, hang on, fish don't live in rocks. God doesn't deceive us. God is the same yesterday, today and tomorrow. And he looked at the history of the Bible and he found an event, Numbers Flood, which would help to explain uh, what was once a fish now being in a rock and so on. You know, here is a, uh, a demonstration of how it matters when we're doing science in the wrong framework, how it's got practical results. You've all heard of coming soon. You've heard of junk DNA. This is simply the belief, and you hear more about that later but this week, but the belief that in our DNA, there's lots and lots of genes that don't seem to do anything. Well, that's what they used to think. And so what was obvious, if you believed in evolution, this was just leftover evolutionary junk. You know, like the appendix was once thought to be, or, you know, we used to have all these dozens and dozens of leftover useless organs. I thought, well, there's another example. In fact, we used to have it shoved down our throats. Well, if God designed, why did he design all that useless DNA and so on? Here's what somebody said recently, and I'll just uh, paraphrase it quickly. Researchers are coming to the belief that, that this non-coding DNA holds all sorts of clues to diseases and so on. And by the way, there's much more that could be said these days. This is the part I wanted you to notice, that a leading figure in world genetics recently claimed that, quote, the failure to recognize the implications of the non-coding DNA will go down as the biggest mistake in the history of molecular biology. It's just one example of how evolutionary thinking can impede progress. You know, it's also... It also matters because it's an issue of honesty. See, Genesis is not like some of those parts of the Bible that we fuss about, where two Christians who both start with a passionate commitment to the truth and authority of the Bible can read the same Bible, come to two different conclusions. You know, in other words, they're both being genuine and honest and using the normal rules of exegesis, but they might give more weight to one thing or another without even thinking it through. But Genesis is not like that. It's not like one of these areas where you sprinkle or whether you dip or one of those sort of things. And you can show that really easily by simply looking at all of the evangelical commentaries from hundreds of years ago. You know, they used to argue among themselves about all these other things, but they never once argued about the six days, the young earth, the world flood, because it was so obvious a 10-year-old could tell you. It was only after outside opinions, you know, the intellectuals, the philosophers, became fashionable and people said, oh, 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 we'd better reinterpret the Bible. We don't want to, you don't want to stay behind the times and things like this. You know, liberals, people who don't believe in the truth and the authority of the Bible and atheists are often your best way of ascertaining what the Bible means because they're not trying to have two bob each way. They're just open to, to telling you this is what the author was obviously saying. And when you go to the very top, to the professors of Hebrew language, you know, at the leading universities, you find there's a unanimity of opinion. One of them we often quote, James Barr, Regis Professor of Hebrew at Oxford University, and he's definitely not on our side, he doesn't like us at all, but he says this, he said, uh, probably so far as I know, there's no professor of Hebrew at any world-class university who doesn't believe, and I'm paraphrasing here, that Genesis 1 to 11 was written in order to convey what? A parable? an idea of uh, why instead of how or some of the fuzzy stuff that you hear, no. That creation took place in six days, which were the same as 24 hours. You know, that word day in that context can only mean that. And we can go into all sorts of uh, reasons why that is. The issue is that the liberals admit it. Secondly, the figures in the genealogies, you know, the begat, 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 they're there for a reason. They were meant to be added up to give you a history a chronology from the beginning of the world. So in other words, you're talking about a world about 6,000 years or so old, not millions or billions 
And thirdly, that Noah's flood covered the whole world and wiped out everything except for those in the ark. And you know the sad thing is, I would have great trouble thinking of a bunch of Bible colleges and seminaries in this country who take a stand on all three of those issues. There's probably less than I can count on the fingers of one hand. And we wonder why true revival doesn't come. We wonder why we're not salting the culture the way we used to when God takes his word so incredibly seriously and these are such major big picture issues. You know, what's the main reason for all this fudging and hedging on Genesis? Particularly, I'm thinking of some of the people who say such wonderful things about the gospel in other contexts. Do you know the sort of person I'm talking about? Are they being consciously dishonest? Well, sometimes. I think it's because some pe such people may be doing what I call loving the Bible to death. What do I mean? They think they're protecting it from being falsified. Oh, we don't want to do that because if you know, science proves that something's wrong or whatever. See, the trouble is, there's been such a hedge, a protective hedge built around Bible history that it's been removed from any relationship to reality. So in the process of trying to protect the Bible, it's been made utterly irrelevant to most people. And friends, what is the point of trying to tell people the good news about Jesus Christ, whom the Bible calls the second Adam, if you don't allow them to believe the bad news about what the first Adam did to mess things up in the first place? What's the point of reading texts in the New Testament, like 1 Corinthians 15, 26, which calls death the last enemy? something to be overcome when you're encouraging people to believe in millions of years, the logical corollary of which is that death was part of the world which God called very good and which he had a system like that going for millions, even hundreds of millions, even billions of years, saying this is fantastic. What's the point of reading verses about everything being restored, which means being put back to something in the future, to a sinless, deathless state when we tolerate and promote at the same time viewpoints which make it clear that there never was a perfect world before man's sin. Where is the logic in singing songs about Jesus being Lord of Lords and King of Kings and at the same time, in effect, calling him, and I say this with great reverence, calling him a liar and an ignoramus because that is what millions of years does. Let me show you why. Here's Jesus talking on the age of the universe and he says, from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Now see on that top timeline, which is the biblical timeline of thousands of years, what Jesus says makes sense. Adam and Eve were created day six, but to scale that puts them pretty well at the beginning. But put in when, the, when man is supposed to have appeared on the millions of years geological time scale and put that big bang to now timeline in, which most evangelicals sort of blithely swallow without thinking about it, and you have the creation of man, man's appearance, right at the end of creation. Hey, that couldn't be more contrasting, could it? Beginning of creation says Jesus, end of creation says human opinion. And that's pretty serious. You know, I was speaking to a professor who's well known in this country. He uh, lectures at many of the leading evangelical Bible colleges on science and faith and so on. And he said, well, you're right. He said, Jesus didn't know any better. I said, what? And he said, well, he didn't have the advantage of um, you know, modern science and so on. So are you saying that you know more than Jesus? He said, well, uh, yes, cough, cough, you know, that's right. But you know, then mumbled something about the theology of the incarnation and so on. Is it any wonder that there's so much confusion in evangelicalism? Why this common belief that one has to desperately reinterpret the Bible in Genesis, a belief which only arose after millions of years captured the imagination of the philosophers and intellectuals, as I said. You know, I think in part it's because of a naive view of science. It's almost as if, if we oppose these secular views on origins, we'll somehow be opposing all of these facts, you know, like the law of gravity. And see, that's how many people see fact, as science. They see it as this whole mess of facts that just speak for themselves. You know, things you can lay on the table and it's obvious. You know, it's not like that. I sometimes uh, show a slide of uh, the Grand Canyon, for instance, and, uh, you know, with all the layers and things like that. And uh, I say, you know, I can show you that you can't possibly look at that, as many Christians do, and say, well, it's obvious, the millions of years hits you in the face and so on. I can read it from the evidence. I can show you that easily, that that's not the case. Even if it had taken millions of years to form those layers and canyons and so on, you couldn't possibly say that. Why is that? 
because you, all you have to do is go back to the great fathers of modern science like Sir Isaac Newton, men with great minds and so on. They saw layers, they saw canyons, they never once saw the millions of years. It never even occurred to them. They had a different belief system through which they were interpreting the facts because as modern philosophers of science now know, facts do not speak for themselves. They always have to be interpreted. Here's Stephen Jay Gould, famous uh, scientist, famous evolutionist. He said, facts do not speak for themselves. They are read in the light of theory. You start with a theory first, a story, a theory of the crime, if you like, in forensic science, detective science, if you like, and then you see how the facts fit and so on. You know, I, I love science. I particularly love the sort of science that sent rockets to the moon, but many people don't realize that it's a different sort of science to evolutionary science. See, rockets to the moon is based upon things like the law of gravity, how the present world works, things that you can test, repeat with an experiment over and over again, but you can't repeat or observe the past, can you? And there's no such thing as a time machine to go back and see these things. So at the end of the day, we're not talking about things that you can prove or disprove anyway. It's a matter of different interpretations. Is that just, just my view? Let me show you a quote from someone who's uh, an Australian educator in science, and he's an evolutionist, and he says this. He says, the Genesis account of creation may even be the correct one, but there is no way science can prove or disprove that, and the creationists know it. Well, yes, we do. But let me say this, that on its own, that one simple statement actually blows out of the water any justification for compromise. Because how can we even consider playing with the words of the infallible holy God because of something which allegedly we're afraid of that might disprove the Bible, but which even evolutionists admit can never disprove the Bible. Science just doesn't have that capacity. You know, science is a wonderful tool, but it's a man-made tool and it's a fallible tool. And by the way, that's why we stress in our talks that we're not trying to prove the Bible with science. That's not what this camp is all about. Because what would that be doing? It would be elevating science to being able to do something which it can't do, as we've already seen. And also means that would be putting science up here and the Bible down there, which is the wrong way around. What we're saying is if you start with the Bible by faith, because it is what it claims to be, the Word of God, who is the truth, knows all things, can't lie, then you will find that a lot of those facts just make so much more sense. It means you won't have all the answers, but you'll have an understanding of the world around you and its history that will be completely different from what you thought it could possibly be. Seeing the world through Bible glasses is often the way we put it. You see, that faith that you begin with, it's not a blind faith. It's not some leap in the dark. That's not biblical faith. But it's faith in something that's reasonable. You know, that's why the Apostle Peter says, give reasons for what you believe. And if you do that, you start with that faith, you will see that. You will see it's not a blind faith. It's not a dumb faith. It's not some, you know, blowing your brains out or leaving them at the church door. By the way, the evidence matters. ARG is far from that position which says, you know, don't worry about the evidence, just believe it, son, you know, because that does incalculable harm. But what we're saying is we can only correctly interpret the evidence if the big picture framework within, we're, we're, within which we're working is the right one. And the problem is that today, the framework that origins science, different sort of science from operation science, which is how the world works, that framework that it operates in starts by assuming the Bible's account of miraculous six-day creation is wrong by definition. It's excluded from the race before the starting pistol is fired. You know, the speakers that you're going to hear at this conference, some of them are world leaders in their field. They don't believe in denying facts, not for a minute. I can say this without even having spoken to some of them on the issue. They would all totally agree with every evolutionist about every fact that's ever been observed. If only more Christian leaders would realize that it's not a battle about facts, it's a battle about interpretations and belief systems. Where the Bible is overwhelmingly clear, it's not only okay to question the interpretations of the scientific consensus rather than questioning the Bible, but to do otherwise is devastatingly damaging to the integrity of the whole Bible message. It's damaging to twist the words of the Bible to pretend they mean something else. And by the way, we're not asking people to put their faith in the theories, even some of the theories you might hear at this camp. We're just fallen, fallible creatures, though saved by grace. 
what we're on about. Because science changes, that's normal. Some of our beliefs and theories about the exact details are going to change, be abandoned and so on. But we're on about getting people to see the exciting way at this camp in which the world makes sense through the lens of the Bible to see how these foundational truths are relevant to all of reality. I hope that you'll see this way of thinking at the super camp and see some of these powerful, exciting answers to these common challenges and questions. Apostle Peter said, 1 Peter 3.15, always be ready, be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. We should always be ready. And we hope that you'll be ready to give answers and to build up the faith of those around you and draw many to Christ as a result. We get hundreds of testimonies each year from people who outside of Christ who became Christians as a result of Christians like yourself, armed and equipped with answers, sharing things with them. We don't expect everyone to become super genius scientists able to answer every question, but you can share at different levels. You can know where the resources are. You can know what they're about. You can lend things to people. You can invite them into your living room, watch a DVD and so on. But this event is more than just teaching, arming and equipping people with answers. It also aims to do what the apostles were on about. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 to 5, it talks about the spiritual warfare, weapons of our warfare and so on. It says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. You know, the very fact that such a major conference is being held here is a huge challenge to compromise. That's a huge challenge to those who seek to belittle the history of the Bible. And beyond that still, we aim to make this camp motivating and encouraging. I believe that seeing highly qualified professionals taking a public stand on the truth and authority of the Bible makes a difference. You know, there are tens of thousands of people like you in this country alone. Mixing with hundreds of them all in one place can be a massive encouragement in and of itself. So in summary, does it matter? In a very real sense, it's on about the most important issue in the universe. Because Christianity doesn't claim to be something sitting on some buffet table labelled personal religion where you can take it or leave it as you choose. Christianity, and I'm talking biblical Christianity, makes startling and universal truth claims. And that's the ultimate reason why so many committed atheists spend so much time and energy trying to demolish Christianity's truth claims, passionately despising this God whom they claim not to believe in. Because whether or not Christianity's claims are true, and they know this, matters more than anything else possibly can. Because it matters not only to how you spend your life, but where you will spend eternity. Where do Christianity's truth claims come from? The Bible. You see, the truth and authority of the Bible is itself one of the truth claims of Christianity. But it is the truth claim upon which all of the other truth claims rest. And we've seen that Genesis history is utterly foundational to the credibility of the Bible's message. Undermine the truth of Genesis, and you've logically undermined the truth and authority of the Bible as a whole, particularly the gospel, with its links to sin and death, between sin and death. And with that, all of the truth claims of Christianity dissolve. This is the battle in which Answers in Genesis finds itself. It's the battle for the truth and authority of the Bible, not some academic side issue. And the Bible really does have the big picture answers to the meaning and purpose of absolutely everything in this life and beyond.